And we are back with the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Your crew is going to be coming at you a little bit more frequently now as the Atlanta Falcons are officially in pads and we are officially here to Let's talk go. more about the preseason. I understand it's the preseason. We haven't gotten to actual action on the field as far as competitive games, but there's been enough action on the practice field mm -hmm. that we can talk and we can update you all as far as what is going on with the Atlanta Falcons. I'm Derek Rackley. That's DJ Shockley. That's Dave Archer. Back as always, here's a quick little snippet of what we're going to talk about today. Obviously, training camp as it stands. Some of the injuries that we've seen so far through camp and kind of what it means as we move forward throughout the rest of the preseason and as the regular season starts. Joint practices with Miami will be going on as we speak or today, uh, this week before they face off their preseason game with the Dolphins later on this week. And then maybe if we have time, we'll get into a little joint practice story time mm. going back to our days with some joint practices. So let's fire it up. Dave, um, of all of us, I don't know, DJ, you might be out here just as much as, as Dave, but I think you might have been out at training camp the most of all three of us here. So let's kind of give people that are listening, people that are watching, a little bit of a snapshot of what you've seen and what's gone down so far in training camp. I think front seven wise, guys, defensively, Shock, uh, you and I have watched a lot of physicality. A mm -hmm. lot. There's a different presence that's a bigger football team. You can feel the presence of the physicality up front. I think that it, that permeates not only the older guys that have come in here, but some of the younger guys. Zach Harrison's a very physical football player, and that kind of translates to what they're looking for from a personality standpoint. On the back end, a lot of depth, a lot of guys that can run, um, and they're going to get tested this week yeah. by that Miami crew down in Miami. So that'll be interesting to see how that plays out during the week. But it's a much more aggressive group. You're seeing a lot more bump and run coverage in, in camp. And sometimes we know that we pick out stuff to work on in camp that you're going to use in, in in the regular season. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be your identity. It seems to be a little bit more identity with the aggressiveness with up front matching it with the back end, a lot of bump and run coverage, a lot of tight jam coverage at the fr at the line of scrimmage, disrupt timing. That's what I see on the off on the defensive side of the football. Offensive side of the football, I still see you kind of trying to find yourself a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think certainly your ability to run the football, the engagement of, of Algier and Cordero and Bijan are a given. I think now blending that with the two talented tight ends, uh, some of these other receivers that are coming in, you know about Drake London, but maybe you don't know as enough about, yeah. you know, a Mac Hollins or where that fits in. So I think there's still an identity search there as to what the passing game will look like. That's just kind of a synopsis that I saw. Yeah, and I think that's understandable, Dave, at yeah. this point in the preseason. We're still early on in training camp, and that's what this is about, kind of discovering what they're – you, you know what their identity wants to be, but you don't know how that's going to look once you actually start getting players running around on the field. The one thing you talked about that kind of stuck out to me about the defensive front, one of their mantras that they're playing with this year is to set the tempo, dictate the tempo and the pace up front with the defense. And it sounds like you're seeing a little bit of that at practice. D, uh, DJ, how about you? Is it anything that stuck out defensively, offensively, that's kind of like, Wow, that looks a little different than years past. Yeah, there were a few things that, that, that you take into account when you're watching practice and you see some of the stuff going on. I think one of the things that stuck out to me, the Arch mentioned it, a guy like Zach Harrison. You think about all the rookies that have been in camp, somehow, some way, have caught an eye here and there. You talk about Bijan, obviously, everybody's seen the video of him going against the linebackers and all that kind of stuff. He's definitely been one of those guys that you pay attention to. But you see, Hennessy goes down. Bergeron has stepped into that, you know, starting spot right now to, to play that role. So he's getting more and more reps. And then you see Clark Phillips has been, you know, back and forth in a couple battles here uh, with, 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 with Drake and all that kind of stuff. So I think these rookies are already making their presence known in camp. And that's something that's fun to watch because sometimes you think about when we first drafted Zach said, oh, man, he's going to have to be a developmental guy. we got to bring him along. Maybe it'll be two, three years before you see him. And here we are in week two. And Arch is already talking about, hey, Zach Harrison has shown that physicality. So maybe some of these rookies are showing that maybe they're ready to play earlier than everybody thought. So uh, I think that's something that fans can pay attention to, especially during preseason, uh, how far along these rookies have come. And I think the thing that I've noticed, too, is the competition throughout camp has been big from every freaking spot that you watch. All these guys are competing. All these guys are going at it. And I remember Terry talking about, Farnell, GM, talking about, hey, it's going to be a hard team to make. 
It's yeah. going to be a lot of lot of spots that we're going to have to – he just said the other day, we're going to cut some really good football players. Yep. And that's a really good thing if you're going into a season thinking, okay, we got some really good players that on other teams would be on that 53-man roster. Well, that tells you how deep this roster already is that, hey, you're going to have to cut some of these really good football players to make your, to make your ball team. And then offensively, I think – you can see how multiple this offense can be. Mm-hmm. There's things you watch at practice and you say, wow, look at that formation. Or, wow, look at where this guy's lined up. There's so many things that you can watch throughout that you can say, okay, Arthur's going to be able to really test a defensive coordinator every single week on where this guy lines up. And I think the word that we've all used, and I think Arthur's used it a little bit, is the positionless football. And that's what I think some of the players have talked about as well on offense is, hey, we can line up anywhere on the field. I had a chance to talk to Penny Hart. He said, I can line up anywhere on the field. And that's one thing when I came here, I was like, man, I got to know everything. Yeah. And that's what's going to be fun is these guys are going to be able to play all these different roles within uh, this offense. And then the last thing, I think the biggest thing is watching how many guys want to get better after practice. Mm-hmm. I mean, Arthur, we see it every day. We come mm-hmm. out there. There's tons of guys out there catching jugs. There's guys out there catching punches. There's guys working on releases. There's guys working on hand techniques. You see – Pretty much, it's like the whole team is already out there. So it's like permeating through everybody. Like, if I'm not out here doing something extra after practice, you know, I'm taking the easy way out. Yeah. So that tells you from a fan standpoint, you got a lot of guys on this team who not just taking it in practice, they're taking it the extra step to be better. And I know this isn't the only place that gets hot in the summertime, but for people that are watching and listening, like, it's been 95 and really hot. So think about these guys having these hour and a half, two hour plus Mm -hmm. practices, doing them in pads, hot, sweaty, tired. The first thing you're thinking about is cold tub, get back in air conditioning, and that's not the case. No doubt. Guys are staying outside. They are staying out, and one other thing that that I'll add to it is, I think the guys love it. We all been there. We all played here. We all know what it's like to be in this environment. But when you walk out here and you see that hill full, there was a couple Saturdays out here where it was absolutely packed. Dave, you just did something with the 98 team, and that whole whole hill was packed. I saw people lined up all the way down the street trying to get in. Yeah. And that tells you fans are excited too, which yeah. is really cool. I know the, fair, the, the, the players can feed off that as well, saying, hey, we got fans that, that believe in us. They want to see us. They want to see what we're about, and that's pretty cool. You know, I took some notes, too, and I just I want you to show you. You mentioned it. What does it say in the topic one that I wrote down? <laughs> competition, competition, no doubt. Competition, right? So we're <laughs> on the same level. And I'm not talking about just competition for roster spots. Yes, that's a given. But the thing that kind of got me excited is hearing and have, watching people report about how when guys get into competitive drills, how – on edge they are, how yeah. competitive they are. I mean, I kind of throw that word around, but like the offense is going against the defense, and the offense, they get hot when they get stopped, yeah. right? That tells you that it means something to them. The defense, they get upset when the offense moves the ball down the field. That's what you want. You want guys that are upset when the other team succeeds because at the end of the day, that's what it's going to be like when they start playing regular season well, games. And they're sharing, they're sharing joy on the field too. Shock and I have watched it. Um, if a guy makes a play down the field, Everybody. quarterback runs down the field, linemen <laughs> run down the field, high five and are jumping up against one another. Same thing on the defensive side of the football. They get a takeaway or somebody makes a big stop. There's a group of guys around. So it's not individual. It's that they're, they're, they're finding joy in somebody's success as a team. They're enjoying that, which I think when you start talking about some of the things you're trying to garner in, in practice and certainly during training camp is bringing the team together, try, try to galvanize the team together. Those moments of celebrating one another and, and yeah. lifting each other up. Those are parts of those little building blocks that you that you count on. And, and, and let me add something to Arthur, what you just said. I'm not going to mention the team or the name. I saw a quarterback speaking uh, just this week about how he said his defense, when they make a play, they go crazy. And everybody's hyped up and they're, you know, could each other. And then he said on their offensive side, they didn't have that same energy. They were still trying to build that. Mm-hmm. So when Arthur says this is already happening, that doesn't happen everywhere. Right. Every right. team doesn't have that continuity and that you know that that energy about them this early in camp where teams are trying to build it. So there's other teams out there, 
that are trying to build it where the Falcons are already doing it. Yeah, I'm not, I don't want to be overly nostalgic, but again, going back to that competition, like there are guys that are on the same field that are competing for a position with that said player that you're talking about, but yet they're still celebrating together. Yeah. That's the important thing about this game. That's why I think that this game translates to more than just on Sundays. It's down the road. Like being excited for somebody that you actually compete with for the same job, <laughs> right? That's, that's a team atmosphere right there. Guys, when we were last on the podcast, I talked a little bit about um, I hope that there's not any injuries. How often do we see that happen? No doubt. Okay. So we've already seen a little bit it happen uh, in training camp, and Arthur Smith addressed it, and he said, unfortunately, it's part of the game. We wish that everybody would be able to play, mm. but it's just not going to happen. That's where you help build depth. So, Arch, we saw an injury somewhat significant early on with Jeff Okuda, right? Although reports have come back that saying that probably just going to miss the rest of preseason, maybe a little bit of the regular season. Good news. S- still trying news. to figure out more details on that. However, with an injury, opens up doors for somebody else. So with that injury to Okuda, how have you th- seen things shake out in the defensive backfield opposite of A.J. Terrell? Well, it's, it's obviously relatively new because we're just a few days into this. But uh, Trey Flowers was the guy that stepped into that spot. He's six foot three long corner that uh, has the ability to be physical with you at the line of scrimmage. Uh, Playing some bump and run, we'll have to wait and see how that plays out. Is he in more of an off corner? I think that's something they'll have to figure out because he's a relatively new member to this team. Mike Hughes is a guy they brought in, a former number one who's a corner that didn't play. looks like going to play nickel. Will he slide out and get more some shots there? There's also some conversation, hey, the dog that is Clark Phillips, the young kid out of Utah, is yep. yep. done a really good job of competing against some bigger receivers. Does that make sense to put a 5'9 corner out there as a rookie and let him get tested in the National Football League? But you're talking about Cornell Armstrong. You're talking about D. Alford. There's a number of players that are get an opportunity to rotate in. Um, it'll be interesting to see in the Miami game how many of those guys do get that opportunity. I would not ex- expect – to see much of A.J. Terrell Correct. in this game. So you're going to get a lot of guys getting a chance to rotate in and play both the corner spots. So they're going to get a pretty good idea based on what they're getting in practice. And don't discount these – these. and I know we're going to talk about combined practices. Let's not discount these two practices. I know you guys know this. This is almost a supplement to a fourth Dang. preseason game, if no. you will. Yep. And then they'll get the preseason game. So they're going to get a lot of work against guys they haven't seen that are different body types, different quicknesses – Different ways of going about things and see how these guys adjust on the fly. Yeah, I mean, we had so we talked about at post draft and free agency all of the bodies that they had, capable bodies in the defensive backfield in case something happened or trying to build depth. And so getting a chance to see that maybe a little bit sooner than in other situations. DJ, the other news that we got kind of on the injury front, maybe the opposite side of it, Calais Campbell removed from the non football injury list. They're still going to be cautious with him coming back, likely not going to get a whole lot of action this week either. But that's good news, knowing that you get one of the NFL's Hmm. most respected and maybe dominant defensive linemen over the past 10 or 15 years is back in the fold and getting closer to getting back on the field. Yeah, as we uh, sit here for this podcast, there you know you, you could see reports of him actually dressed out down in Miami, going through some drills with, with the team. So it's good to see him back. But having, like you mentioned, having a guy who's been around for his 16th year, having him around, having him just in the huddle, having him a part of drills is so valuable for younger players, valuable for everybody who is around that defensive line group. And this guy can sit back and literally see things that are happening and be able to help these guys on the field doing it. So next rep, this guy can go out and say, okay, Calais just told me X, Y, and Z, Mm -hmm. and then he can go out and try to execute it. It's nothing like having a guy with that kind of experience on the field and having that opportunity to be a part of it. And then then we just talked about Akuda, you know, being out for a little bit and other guys possibly stepping up. It's the same thing with Calais in up front. you got tons of other guys in that D-line group who we started to show off talking about that front seven, the physicality and athleticism of those guys has shown itself already. Guys who probably wouldn't have gotten all those reps if Calais was out there early, now got those reps. Mm-hmm. Maybe they built some confidence before he came back so that now when they do get those two or three reps maybe that they get in the team period or, or one-on-ones, they, they realize they are special. And then now you got that guy out there ready to go for you. Yeah, there's an interesting dynamic with Calais here that I think that people may be not paying attention to. I mean, 100 career sacks. You guys mentioned he's been as good as it gets over the years he's been in the league. There's a brilliance and a, and a 
a genius attached to what he can do that he could probably stand there and tell somebody till he's blue in the face, hey, you know, come with a rip technique, arm over, spin, all that kind of stuff. That dude may not be able to do that. Now, I can tell you <laughs> that's what you need to do. So the physical rep, like Shock talked about, about him actually being able to get some reps and and display. We all know we we get told it in meetings. We get shown how to do it, and then maybe maybe there's someone that can also give us a demonstration. That's how we learn as football players. I think it's going to be really important for him to be on the field just in practices, maybe not necessarily in games and preseason. To give these guys, yeah, they're looking at Grady and some of these other guys, but to be able to see him do what he does, don't know you can copy it, yep. but here's what it looks like. I can yep. tell you about it. Let me see what it looks like. He's going to be able to show that to him and then say, okay, I, now I see why you have 100 sacks. I just think there's, <laughs> there's a difference between being told and being shown and being given, given the demonstration. I think that's going to be key for him to be on the field. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I remember, and I wasn't an offensive lineman, but after I left Atlanta, I went to Seattle, and I got to watch Walter Jones play left mm. tackle. And to see this guy that was, I don't know, three. I mean, right, you had, to, you had to kick like an offensive lineman. So, I mean, come on, <laughs> come on. 350, you had to have feet work. 20 pounds, like, move around like he was on ice skates, right? Those are the times that I'm talking about. Like, when you watch people that have been so successful and so dominant throughout their career in the NFL, and then you can actually watch their technique. Mm. Yeah, because no offense to coaches or, or sitting down in meetings. But when you got like an all pro player that you can ask like, hey, when you face this type of guy, like what type of footwork are you using? Mm. And then you better just shut up and listen. Like just hear everything that he has to say, soak it in like a sponge, because those are the little moments like you're talking about, Arch, that are going to make you a better player. Again, not trying to discount the coaches, but guys that have done it against elite competition year after year are the ones that are probably going to give you the tips that are going to help your career the most. So let's talk about joint practice with Miami. We've talked a little bit about it, Arch. For the casual fan, other than the fact that they get to go hit another player, another yeah. jersey, right? Yeah. What are the importances of these practices? Well, you're going you're gonna to get honest looks, okay, because what happens inevitably in, in joint practices, and I've participated in many of these through the years, uh, whether it was Miami coming to us or we went to, to wherever, we – what happens is your own guys begin to understand what you're doing. They get signals. If you're in one-on-ones and you signal something out, don't think the DB's not looking at it. He says, okay, this guy's running a hitch route or this yep. guy's running a stop and go, whatever it is. And so they begin to cheat the routes yep. or squat on routes. In these joint practices, because it's you're just getting two practices with the Dolphins, they don't know what you do. Mm-hmm. It's not like they studied tape before you came down here. So you're going to get some honest looks, as to, and it's going to give you more of a real idea where guys are. If this guy's running a route to manipulate a corner to either drive him off or get his shoulders turned so he can go, it's going to be real. You're going to get a real look as a quarterback as to when to let that ball go, whereas you may be getting cheated in practice out here because our guys know our guys, and they're going to squat on stuff, yeah. and they're going to jump guys because yep. they've been doing it with them for two weeks now yep. or three, yep. or maybe even into last year where they know their body language. Yep. To me, that's the first thing that jumps out is you're going to get real opportunities to kind of get an idea where you are at this point in camp. Yeah. And, DJ, one of the things that I thought about, to to take Dave's point a little bit further, is as a coaching staff, yeah, you're going to find out about the guy's competitiveness and how much he wants it and is he going to stick his heels in the ground, so on and so forth. But you're going to find out how how each player can rely on their technique and their mechanics. Because you're right. You're not – like if you're an offensive lineman – and, and you're facing the same defensive lineman, the same five to eight you know guys for a couple weeks. Yeah. You know all their moves. Yeah. You know what they like to do. They like to bull rush. They like to grab and pull, right? But now you're going to face a defensive lineman that you don't know what his move is. So now you have to sit back and you got to trust your technique. Mm-hmm. you got to trust your footwork. you got to trust your hands. Those are all the things that I feel like you get out of joint practices other than the kind of increased level of competition. Well, and as a fan, you might be saying, well, I can study the tape and I know what Grady's moves are. Right. Yeah, but you didn't physically you go feel against him. him. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. If you physically feel him for a couple of weeks or even a part of last year, then you do have a gauge on him. Where the Christian Wilkins, different mm-hmm. dude, bigger yeah. style, different yeah. guy, different style, maybe his push-pull is different than Grady's, you just made the point. You rely on what you know, and it's, you're not getting tricked here. It's what you know at that point. 
Uh, it's hard for me to add anything to what you guys said because I, I think that's exactly where these joint practices go. And I think the other part of you, you was about to bring it up was about the evaluation part of it from everywhere, from the coaching staff, to see how these guys respond in these certain spots. Like some of these guys may go out and they've had a great camp and they, like you mentioned, they know what certain guys are going to do and they get beat a couple times. How's this guy going to respond versus somebody else when you're in a whole different environment and now the coaches can sit back and say, okay, I saw him get beat, but he jumped right back into the next series and was ready to go, as opposed to being here, he knows, oh, I get another chance to go against that guy. I know who, what he's all about. And I think that's probably the biggest part of this is when you go into these joint practices, you guys both just mentioned it, about going against somebody else, which actually gives you an idea of, okay, how do I respond when I don't know what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. Like we've seen, like you guys have talked about, I know this guy's move. I know this guy, when he starts to break down, he's going to come out of his route. And you can be in a kind of what we call a, a safe zone while you're in practice. Everything feels comfortable to you. Mm -hmm. When you get out of these joint practices, there's going to be moments where you're going to be real uncomfortable mm -hmm. in a particular rep or drill. And how do you respond afterwards? I think it's going to be a huge deal for that evaluation process. Well, and that's such a good point, Shock, because the other element to that is the dudes on the other side that are wearing the Dolphin uniforms, they don't care anything about you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Whereas Dez drops and throws here at Flowery Branch, those defensive guys, that's their guy. That's yeah. their quarterback. Yeah. And not that they're not going to try to steal the ball from him and take it from him. But there's a caring for both. Those guys don't care about you. They're competing. So you do get a little bit more of that step towards, hey, it's us against the world mentality. It's mm -hmm. us against Miami. Whereas we're all together out here at Flowery Branch. And you're still trying to be competitive, which you guys pointed out. It's how good and competitive it is out here. But there's still that little bit of edge that you start to gain a little bit as you're going to feel in games. So as we gradually progress towards the regular season, this stuff all can, starts to grow together. The last thing I'll throw out from my experience, and, and you kind of talked about it with the edge, I'm going to take it one step further. The other thing that you tend to get sometimes at joint practices uh -oh. are some chippiness, <laughs> some fights. They <laughs> end up breaking yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Now, sometimes it doesn't happen. And again, they're all everybody's like a, you know, it's a brotherhood still, no matter whether you play for the same team or another team and they're going to shake hands afterwards. But I just know from, punk me. from my experience, when we went up to Tennessee one time, like I swear every drill was like <laughs> breaking out at some point, whether it was punt block and, and working on special teams or obviously nine on seven inside drill when you're running the football, offensive, defensive linemen, linebackers are going to get after it all the time. And again, there's nothing malicious about it. It's just guys that are competing and it's training camp and they're frustrated and they're trying to make an impression. And so if you start to see reports <laughs> about fights breaking out, mm -hmm. don't freak out. <laughs> it just happens. It happens in regular training camp too. But that is uh, another thing that sometimes happened in joint practices. Dave, you mentioned that you've done a number of them throughout the years. What are some of your memories, maybe your fondest memory or two, if there's such a thing as them being fond? Well, I, yeah, I don't know if it was fond. Miami used to come up here with us when Dan Marino was the quarterback there the Marx Brothers at wide receiver. So Dang. it was essentially, it was a mm. it was a cast of celebrities that yeah. came in here. And you almost found yourself starstruck <laughs> because here's Marino, here's Mark Duper, yeah. here's Mark Clayton. I found, I, I wasn't the only one. I found three or four teammates of mine. We ended up standing on the sidelines watching them do it. And we're supposed to be in another drill. <laughs> hey, Archer, you're going to come join us? Uh, you, you, know, you had to run down to the to get to your drill. It's coach, it's Marino. You got, yeah, <laughs> this is damn Marino. So, and I was only in my second or third year in the league yeah. when we started doing this. So, yeah, a little bit starstruck there. And you say, wait a minute, I'm, on the, I'm in the league with him. So, I need to <laughs> be doing my thing. And so that was kind of a realization. I think that was the funniest thing that kind of came out of it. Like you said, some of the chippiness. I remember uh, the Giants came and participated with us in a, in a couple of joint practices in their heyday back in the mid-'80s uh -huh. when, when Bill Parcells was coaching there. And we had an actual one-on-one -on -one pass rush drill where we had an actual quarterback drop and a throw. And as you guys know, those are one-on-ones tackle yep. and an end yep. or a guard and a defensive tackle, and they're battling, and they'll blow the whistle at some point. Well, they had a young defensive end coming off the edge, and he got by our tackle, and he just blew. Turk Schoner was my backup at the time here. Blew Turk Schoner up. Just ran right through him. I thought Bill's Parcells was going <laughs> to kill this guy. Okay? Because it was, com you know, that's completely – you're talking about getting your scholarship taken yeah, away yeah, from yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Fines, all that kind oh, of yeah. stuff. You cannot hit the quarterback. I don't care what the drill is. And he just destroys one of our quarterbacks – 
on a one-on-one -on -one pass to us, and Bill Parcells completely undressed this guy. I stood there with my mouth open. <laughs> I didn't know you could say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can say that to another man? <laughs> He's grown uh, too. Yeah, and that might have been the end of actual quarterbacks training <laughs> <laughs> in that drill. Yeah, now now, ball now they use a ball boy, a poor kid that doesn't have any uh, any pads on. DJ, any memories from you? Uh, yeah, I remember one year, the one year that we didn't play Jacksonville in the uh, in the preseason. We still found a way uh, to go down and do some joint practice. And I remember going against uh, a guy who I played with at Georgia, okay. and he played linebacker. And imagine in like a team drill. I'm walking up to the line. I'm trying to, you know, I'm identifying the mic. I'm, you know, looking at safeties. He walks up with the A guy. Shock you remember that time you went to that bar? <laughs> Shock you remember that time you fell in the shot? And this is like, I'm trying to be serious. I'm trying to focus and think. <laughs> and he's saying this every time we come to the line. He's bringing something else up and he's talking. So I'm trying to block him out and then go. And then one time I roll out, same play, I roll out to the left. And I'm, I, maybe I complete it, maybe I don't. He gives me a little flipper as he's going off. I kind of fall off to the yeah. side a little bit. But the fact that, you know, it was just fun, fun, fun times having, you know, going against some guys you you know, maybe you, you know, went against. Like you say, you know guys that you go against and you, you're all instructing. There's other guys who, you know, they're trying to throw you off your game. And he had been around for, you know, three or four years now. So it wasn't nothing to him to, right, right. you know, be out there talking. So it was just, it was just fun to have that kind of robbery while you're in practice and, I'm locked in focus. He's, you know, as trying to get me. If it's not off. enough as a young quarterback, and no all doubt. That you got to think about pre snap. Whew. Now you got to tune out somebody talking mess to you. No doubt. Guess what? That happens in yeah. the games as yeah. well. Uh, I'll be real quick. I remember the time that we went up and faced Tennessee. Uh, you guys remember Albert Hainsworth? Oh, yeah. I mean, you talk about a dude that was just. Some monster. I mean, he was a monster, number one, but he was the, <laughs> the king of being chippy and wanting to start fights. And, dude, I swear, every drill that we played, he was getting in somebody's face, <laughs> playing after the whistle, maybe grabbing a face mask or something. And I'd be over on the side, and all of a sudden, you just hear everything break out. And I was like, oh, here, here we, we go, go again. <laughs> here we go again. But those were the times that Steve McNair was there, rest in peace. Um, Keith Bullock was with the linebacker. He was, he was always talking. There's some good teams. Uh, there, always had his jersey. He tucked up underneath his shoulder pads. So here's, here's a question: Do the coaches really like it? Do they want to see their team have a little fight, or they're, of course they're going to say we don't want that happening, we don't need to be fighting? But does the coach really want to see his team yeah, probably get after bit. him? A I don't bit. know if they're ever going to talk about that. In the yeah, media. yeah, right, 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 right. <laughs> but it's like, how is this guy going to respond when somebody mm -hmm. gets all up in his Might face? Slaps him in the face. Yeah. <laughs> you remember Brooke getting thrown out of practice? We oh had, yeah, we had a combined practice. I oh, think yeah. with New England down here. Or somebody. Okay. Yeah. And and Brooking kept getting in a fight with this one particular offensive lineman, and about the fourth time. They just toss Brooking. <laughs> our guy, our coach is just tossing. Get, him. Out, of Get out of here. Get out of here. We don't want you in here anymore because I mean, he could he couldn't he wouldn't stop fighting guys. <laughs> Brooke was one of the like the one of the guys that I tell people like off the field, like he would have glasses, yeah, soft yeah, yeah, yeah. Feel that. Like just like look like a normal regular dude. You yeah. get him on the field, and he's he all over the Tasmanian place. Tasmanian yeah. devil, yeah. no doubt. I mean, he would regular practices. He'd be breaking out in fights too. But that was just the the passion uh, that he ended up playing with. So anyway, that'll kind of wrap it up for us. Give you some stories of our times <laughs> doing joint practices. Falcons commencing with uh, the Miami Dolphins right now, concluding with a preseason game later this week, and we'll get to see some actual play on the field. Probably won't get a chance to see very many starters. Is kind of the status quo these days days in the NFL, but then some of these backups are going to play some very critical roles, especially for this Atlanta Falcons team. Thanks so much for joining us here. Continue to like, subscribe, and review us on whatever platform it is you get your podcasts, and we will be back very soon, maybe even next week, with some more okay, information now. for Let's you go. as we break down the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Thanks, everyone. Take care.